you're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Zach Bechtold and Matt Franks. We hope you enjoy today's podcast and check us out online at beardedtheologians.com. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. And today we have a very special guest with us. We have the Reverend Matt Miofsky. He's the lead pastor at The Gathering in St. Louis. And he's, gonna, he's got a new book coming out. Uh, he's doing some cool things there in St. Louis. And so, uh, Matt, we're, we're glad to have you with us. And uh, tell us a little bit, little bit more about yourself and, and what you do. Yeah, hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, like you said, my name is Matt. I'm United Methodist Pastor. I started a church called The Gathering in the city of St. Louis 10 years ago, and it's been a pretty wild ride ever since then. So um, now we have four sites uh, throughout the city and are con- continuing to experiment with sort of how to translate faith and offer faith to new generations of people, particularly in an urban area. So it's a fun set of questions and, and people to do ministry with. So that's kind of what keeps me busy day in and day out. So like, like Zach said, uh, you have a new book coming out. Um, you want to talk about that, that book study coming out that uh, is available on Coach sure. and Amazon? Yeah. Uh, so uh, last year after Christmas, so oftentimes after Christmas, as most pastors do, you know, you think about all the people that are there on Christmas Eve and, you know, how do we offer something or invite them back and offer something that a person may be disconnected or disinterested in church? might actually be interested in. So uh, last year I did a sermon series uh, called Happy, What It Is and How to Find It. And it led to just some amazing conversations in our church. A lot of people who were disconnected or not a part of a church were intrigued. And it opened up just a really cool conversation in our church about what makes for real happiness and sort of the way our world defines happiness and the way the culture does. And so it just so happened that as I was preaching that, an editor from Abingdon uh, was listening online and said, hey, I think this would be a great book. Uh, And it meshed with my own interests because um, I had always said if I ever wrote a book, which was never really on my bucket list, to be honest, but if I ever wrote a book, I wanted it to be the kind of book that you could hand to your neighbor, whether they're a church person or not, that a normal person might actually read. Uh, as opposed to some insider thing. And so this felt like a great, uh, a great attempt. So I, so I wrote the book. It's called Happy, What It Is and How to Find It. And the skeleton of it was that sermon series. But of course, I added quite a bit more for book form. But really, the premise of the book is, uh, what is happiness? And where do we go looking for it? And along the way, uh, I kind of point out that we have a, a great tendency as human beings to look in the wrong places and to ignore the wisdom of a lot of generations of people that have gone before us that try to wave the, the flag and say, hey, um, go down this road, not that one. And yet we kind of keep plowing down that same road. So um, that's really what the book is about. It's just kind of about the, uh, what is real happiness? And then how do we go about finding it in our lives? And so I think it's applicable whether a person has never been to church before in their life all the way up to us pastors who can get quite caught up in uh, some of those same worldly definitions of what makes for success and happiness. For sure. I, that, that's great. I, I love, I love that whole concept of, of really identifying um, where we do go to find happiness. Cause you're right. As people, we do have that propensity to uh, go, go places we shouldn't. Um, it, that's interesting. So your your church, the gatherings there in an urban setting, right? That's right. How how did the um, how did your congregation and, and the people in that setting um, respond to just the sermon series that that kind of birthed the, this book? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're in an urban setting, and we're in the shadow of a of Washington University in St. Louis. It's a you know, the people who go there are very successful, very bright, kind of on their way to great things. They're thinking about uh, how they want to make a difference in the world. It's a fun environment because it certainly influences the neighborhoods that we're in. And so I think that 
by stopping for a second and saying, you know, before you go too hard, too fast down the road of getting this degree and going to this graduate school and wanting to get this job and wanting to make this amount of money and, you know, what if we take a step back and just ask a more fundamental question? What are we really aiming for? And is what we're aiming for um, really going to make us happy even if we ever attain it? And so I think for people in my church, it, it really complemented some of their pursuits in life and helped them ask a, a more fundamental question that even if I succeed at the things I'm trying to accomplish, w- will that will that make me any happier than I am today? Or, or is there maybe a flaw in the logic, so to speak? Uh, and, and so I think that was what was most interesting. And, you know, I, I like to joke around that we as human beings, you know, we haven't gotten very creative in three, 4,000 years. We still kind of chase after some of the same things. So a, a big part of the book is uh, a, a little study of Ecclesiastes, which I think is kind of the biblical book that most clearly aligns with our own maybe uh, pursuits for happiness. And so you kind of look, my, my premise of Ecclesiastes, if I had to like put it in a nutshell is, um, here's a guy who did a happiness study. You know, tradition says it's Solomon, so we'll use his name. But here's Solomon and he kind of decides, I'm gonna chase after each of these things and see what they lead to. So he goes after money. And he goes after fame and he goes after achievement. He goes after wisdom and he he goes after pleasure and partying and kind of the drug, sex and rock and roll avenue. And, and it's fascinating. And he gets to the end of the line and he tells us what he found out. And I think that actually in thousands of years, our own pursuits haven't changed all that, all that uh, much. And so it's kind of cool to go back and look at something like in the Bible that many people think is like so disconnected or irrelevant and find out that, Oh, wow. Uh, here's a guy who's chasing after a lot of the same things that I'm chasing after. Maybe I should pay attention to what he found out. So that's kind of the first chapter of the book uh, is, Hey, let's take a look at a a happiness study done a few thousand years ago. I I absolutely love that. Ecclesiastes is one of my, uh, gosh, it's one of my favorite Old Testament books, uh, but one of my favorite scriptures in it, and I, and I don't know if you explored this in your book or not, and I, I hope you do. Uh, he makes this point often. Um, he just says, everything's perfectly pointless. Uh, and, and that's so profound to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> it makes me laugh. <laughs> I got to say, um, I got to say, Zach, that the, the, the title of the first chapter of my book is Nothing Will Make You Happy. And That's it's awesome. Total, it's, it's a total Ecclesiastes quote. I mean, the, you know, at first read, Ecclesiastes can be uh, one of the most demoralizing books of the Bible. But right. I like to joke around that it's the only book of the Bible that's so demonstrably true. Uh, you know, that, that he chases after all this stuff and finds out, man, this stuff was really pointless. But if people read the first chapter, they'll see that by the end, um, I really talk about why I think why there's hope actually in that sort of a statement, you know, whether it's perfectly pointless or nothing will make me happy that, that let's start there. There's actually a lot of hope and it becomes the launch pad for what happiness actually is. Um, Absolutely. And I, and I think for me, that's why that, that statement's so powerful because you know, you get a whole scope of the whole, the whole book and you're like, Oh, Oh, man. I, don't, you, don't you think it's just like a perfect statement for, you know, whatever realm we're in, but for like postmodern young skeptics, what a great book. I mean, oh, absolutely. You know, the, the, the Bible does not sugarcoat reality. It's not milk toast, as a lot of people might assume. And there's no better evidence for that than just the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, I agree 100%. <laughs> I love it. Which is probably why you're a real Rockies fan, Zach. You're just searching. It really is. And realizing that you'll never it is. find it. It is. You know, <laughs> April through November is just perfectly pointless for me. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're so still we're, one other Rockies fan listening. I'm sorry. I still yeah. um and and i can't remember um i mean we don't have a copy of the book but i and i did i remember listening to that sermon series but um i think it was you that that uh, through that sermon series that that turned me on to the happiness index that that the united nations puts out have you ever 
I can't remember yeah. where I stumbled upon that, but um, there's a couple of interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Well, and I was just to say, um, you know, when you were putting this together, what what did you discover uh, about, uh, you know, as you were doing your research, not only for your sermon, but as you were putting together the book, like what was kind of like the biggest thing that you discovered that that shaped you um, in putting this all together? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, one of the early uh, kind of resources that I found was actually, a, it came from a TED talk that uh, I heard, and it, it's from a professor at Harvard who leads the, what's called the happiness study at Harvard. And, and the name of the TED talk is what's, you know, what makes a good life. But what fascinated me was actually the, the study that he leads. So Harvard, it's one of the longest longitudinal studies that's ever been conducted. It's been going on for 75 years. It's on its, I think he's the fifth director of the study. And the whole premise of the study is what, what makes people happy. So they've followed these Harvard uh, at the time they were undergraduate men, they later added women and just followed them over the course of their entire life. And they, I mean, they studied everything, their health, their, you know, their well-being, their financial success, everything. And along the way, they would ask them, what, what do you think is going to make you happy? And then actually test that along the way, what does. And so what they find out at the end, you, I mean, you, you have to read the book, but in the first chapter of the book, I show how remarkable it is that after millions of dollars, literally decades of time, Tens of thousands of pages have been written about happiness just from this one study alone. And what's, what's so remarkable is in the end, what they found out aligns so much with what scripture already talks about and tries to, <laughs> to tell us is true. And so what I think was really cool is whether it's that study from Harvard or some other studies that on happiness, I think it's remarkable actually how much the wisdom of the world, so to speak, is dovetails with what scripture taught us a couple thousand years ago. So if we just have the ears to hear and the eyes to see, I think that, um, that, that actually there's a lot about scripture and uh, these you know, various happiness studies that aligns. And so that, that's what I think is really cool about it, is whether someone's skeptical about religion or a huge believer there's some common ground here around this question. Everybody's interested in it. You know, I say it's, it's, it's one of, if not the most universal question we have is like kind of what makes for a good life or what makes us happy. Through, through, uh, <clears throat> through your studies of happiness and things like this, did you, uh, at any point, did you Google happy? Oh, and yes. just see what comes up? <laughs> oh, yeah, I found I found all sorts of funny things, you know, I mean, there's <laughs> the world of Google, you know, anybody can publish anything. So mm -hmm. you really get, and, and you begin to see why this is such a tough question for people. Cause you Google something like happiness. And if you click on, you know, if you just pick five random links on the first couple pages, you'll find all sorts of contradictory information about what makes, what makes people happy. And uh, sorting through all that, it's no wonder that a lot of us are like, you know what, I'm just going to go with my gut or I'm just going to, you know, just going to do what I feel, or I'm just going to try this or try that uh, because there's so much out there. And so I think that that's, what's nice. And, and I said this at the beginning of the book, I'm going to ground the book in what scripture says about happiness because if we chase after every definition and every study and every thing that's been written, I mean, we'll be chasing our tail constantly. And, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not an expert on the topic, but I do think that we can, we can uh, offer something to the conversation that can maybe ground and center people so that as they go out and have to make these decisions about, Hey, what, what should I do or what should I pursue or where should I invest my time or how should I treat my money or whatever it is they can be grounded in the wisdom of scripture. And so I hope it offers people that it's certainly not meant to be the end all be all on happiness. It's not meant to, uh, to necessarily argue with or supplant some of the wisdom that you can read elsewhere. But I do think it, it's meant to 
kind of give us a lens so that as we read and encounter different positions, we can sort of filter it through some very basic things that scripture says about what makes for a happy life. No, I think that's perfect. I mean, as pastors, as, as people with, with influence and power, you know, if we, if we use our books or our pulpit or our podcast to say, hey, this is how you should feel or do or act, uh, we're abusing that. And uh, so to leave that question open, I mean, that's, that's what we're all about here is having the conversation. We want yeah. people to think and be like, man, I disagree with those guys, but here's why. Or, oh, man, I've never thought of that, you know. Right. Um, just give them a lens to look through. Yeah, and, and, and for me, that's always how I've approached preaching in general, because uh, not only do I think people, I think people will reject if I just stand up there and try to always tell them what to think or believe, but more importantly, I mean, we can't predict or talk, speak to every nuance of the decisions that people have to make each and every day that are complicated. And, and so I think if we can give them tools of faith, so that they can go out and hopefully under the guidance of the spirit with the wisdom of scripture, make faithful decisions. I, to me, that's what it's all about. And we're going to get some wrong. I mean, shoot, that's why we have confession every week. It's like, we all come back and say, Oh, <laughs> I think I messed this one up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you probably did. And it doesn't mean we don't speak to truth or I don't at times uh, speak in really declarative ways, but I think, you know, we all have to go out and try to figure this out mm -hmm. and we come back together and we share our, you know, field notes and, and try to, and, and try to grow. And so, you know, this book is, is really written in the same line. There's actually three. So I wrote the book and it's really for individual use. You can share it with a friend, you can read it, but there's also a leader's guide and then a DVD component. And my hope is actually that whether it's a book group, a Sunday school class, or an entire church study, I hope people will read it together because I, I really do think th your conversations and your journey will be enriched if you engage other people and say, hey, what'd you find out? Man, let me tell you, I've actually been down this road and here's what I found out and this is true. And this is not. So I think it's, um, I wrote the book so that people can read it and share it with a neighbor, but I really think it's an awesome thing for a church to just say, Hey, for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about this and let everybody read it, have Sunday school classes or small groups talk about it. Cause that's really where the cool stuff happens. I mean, mm -hmm. my book's just a really kind of a launch pad for the cool stuff, which is the conversations that people have, whether it's in a Sunday school class or around a fire or sitting in a, you know, living room, drinking a few beers or whatever it is, that's where I think the cool stuff happens. Absolutely. I, I think you're, I think you're spot on. And, uh, you know, maybe after we get this, uh, yeah, after it comes out and people get, uh, get it going, maybe we can have, uh, have our own little, little four week podcast on it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that's like, that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, be awesome. Well, it's, it's funny. I'll, I'll, I'll spoil the beginning a little bit. I, I opened with, uh, this was years ago. I was in, um, in Chicago in Millennial Park and there was this art display and the premise of the display was, uh, it was a photographer who took pictures of families from all around the world. And the, uh, the question that the photographer asked every family from all these different countries all around the world, one question, it was, what do you want for your kids? That was the question, something like that. And, and, and he said the answers were remarkably um, universal, that it was some version of, I want my kids to, to be better off than I am. I want them to be happy. Some version of that answer. And so I kind of said that, you know, there's not a lot of things that are universal that span really different contexts and cultures, but this question is at least uh, close. I mean, it's one that no matter where you are, rich or poor, no matter what nation you live in, third or first world, people are, are, are asking and answering this question. So I think it's just tailor-made for groups because, hey, we're all gonna have really unique and different insights, but we're all asking the same mm -hmm. basic question you know and I, I think what fascinates me about that question is it is it spans the generation gap uh regardless of generation you're right that the, the answer to that question is pretty pretty close yeah uh, and, and offers conversation for 
um, more than just a group of young people or youth or, uh, you know, adults with kids or, or grandparents. I mean, it really does. It, it, it spurs that conversation that everybody can come, come together and say, Hey, here's, here's where we're at. Right. But we're not that far off. <laughs> we're not that different. Yeah, no, I, th I think you're right. It's, it's been funny. I, I, you know, I've talked to some people who are like, Oh, I wish you would have, you know, happy. I don't know. I mean, scripture calls us well, happiness is, cheap and transitory and scripture calls us to something different. And, but I love the word happy because again, to me, that's a, that's a word we all kind of use. I mean, if we get, if we get into the word blessed, which I talk about in the beginning of the book, I don't know for anyone who reads the common English Bible, the new CEB translation, the Beatitudes are actually now happier those instead of blessed are those. And I know a lot of people just hate it. They say, Oh gosh, we took a beautiful, deep, theological word like blessed and we just turned it into a cheap American shallow word like happy. But I actually make the opposite argument. I love, cause that's, you know, the, the Greek word can mean it meant happy and happy is a, a word that we all use. We all, we all strive after. Um, whereas sometimes blessed and words like that, they can just sound so distinctly Christian. And let's be honest, Christians use blessed about as shallowly as the culture uses happy. And so both the word happy or blessed or whatever, both of them can have kind of a cheap, transitory, based on circumstances sort of definition. And both of them can also have this sort of deeper and more profound definition. And so that's really what I'm going for in the book. So while the word is one that we can sometimes have positive or negative connotations of, underneath it we all know that there's there's the opportunity to to kind of define that in a, a cheap way or to really dive deep and so that's what i i hope to do in the book is let's get underneath the everyday understandings yeah i know what you're thinking zach you were thinking back to the uh our conversation about that was it like three weeks ago that we actually talked about um the beatitudes and the the ceb from uh blessed to happy and um yeah it, it, it you know the first time i remember when it when the ceb first came out i was so excited you know it was this new readable translation of the bible mm -hmm. and so i sat down and and you know went to the one of, you know one of my favorite scriptures it was in is, is matthew 5 and i was like happy yeah. Like this, the no, no. <laughs> like no, <laughs> no. Um, but then when I went back and read through their notes and kind of you know reflected on it a little bit, it, it actually makes really good sense because when you start looking at people who are in certain circumstances that maybe are poor, you know, um, you know, in the ministry that I've worked with and been in with the poor, it's amazing to see how happy they are sometimes, and they don't have near amount of stuff. Uh, that that I have, and it's been really fun uh, to get to know people who uh, are happy, but aren't necessarily happy in the way in the context in which we uh, put ourselves in. And um, it's just kind of one of those things that um, I think the more that we strive happiness, I think it it almost pulls us away. It seems like. Um, yeah, and, and I'm I'm clear. Like in the introduction, I know some people skip introductions in books, but the introduction of this book's really important because in it, I kind of say, look, when I use the word happy, you know, a lot of people use that word as sort of the foil to a deeper word, joy or blessed or something like. You know, there's happiness and there's joy, and I, I kind of say at the beginning, I'm using the word happy. Here's why, but here's really the biblical words that I'm that we're going to talk about, and I, I really say that there's two biblical ideas. They contribute to my definition of happiness. One is the Old Testament or the Hebrew word shalom. In the New Testament, it's irene. We translate it as peace, which has this idea of a kind of wholeness and completeness. And then the word blessed in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And these two ideas and words shape um, what I mean when I say happy. So I kind of go through a little bit of that in the introduction, just kind of grounding it. So for people who get, can get caught up in the semantics of which word do we choose, that what we're going to be talking about is the biblical idea of, of, of peace and blessedness. Awesome. Uh, Zach, do you have anything else? Uh, I don't know. I could sit here and talk to Matt all day. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> 
Well, come on, let's. Uh, uh, no, we really appreciate it. Is um, gosh, is there anything, uh, anything else that you have you want to add? Anything that you want to highlight that you're doing in ministry or? Uh, well, it's sort of funny that so happy. I I, I heard word it, it just came out. Like Cokesbury is shipping it now. You can buy it on Barnes and Noble and Target and of course Amazon. And I'd love to hear from people if they find it useful. Um, I've been encouraging people like buy two because I'd really love you not only to read it, but to give a copy to, like to somebody. I just think it, I, I'm really intrigued. Today I had a guy at my house who was fixing something. He was an electrician and he doesn't go to church. And I said, man, would you take this as a gift? And just, I'd love to know what you think about it. Because So I kind of challenge people. It can be kind of a fun little way to engage somebody, like just hand them a copy. Um, and I also, I'm working on a second book, and I don't know if this is a sign or not, but um, the second book I'm working on it is Fail, What to Do mm -hmm. When Things Go Wrong. And I hope that isn't what happens to my publishing career. But uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by these sort of simple questions that get at you know, I think things that we all really struggle with. So um, I'd love, I'd love for people to engage happy. I, I hope churches use it and find it useful. It certainly on a practical level was a great way for us to engage people who maybe were a bit skeptical. And then my next project, and I hope it comes out later this year, is going to be uh, called Fail, uh, What to Do When Things Go Wrong. So uh, maybe when that gets a little closer, you know, We'll get yeah, back we'll, together and we'll talk about there, failure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Let's be honest. As pastors, isn't this what we all fear and have to deal with daily? Is like, oh, man, that didn't work. Now I got to try well, something different. <laughs> well, I was thinking if you needed a forward or, or something for the back cover, <laughs> Matt and I fell all the time. So we, <laughs> yeah. we like to come up. We have a lot of experts. <laughs> <laughs> So no, that's, we, we appreciate you coming on and, and having the conversation with us and uh, sharing a little bit of your heart um, through this. And, and we definitely want to want to help promote the book and, and uh, what you guys are doing there. Um, and so, so thanks. Thanks for being on. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. It's, it's fun to, to talk, talk with you both. Yeah. So one, one thing that we always like to do when we close the show, um, we, we always like to encourage our listeners to, uh, to think a little bit. Uh, we, we try to ask a little a, a probing question. So, uh, you know, keeping on the theme of the book, what, what makes you happy and where are you going to find it? Uh, and and as, you, as you think about that, and if you can get your hands on a couple of copies of the book, one for you to keep, one to, one to give to somebody, uh, or leave at the coffee shop, or, or whatever, yep. you know, how, however that, that goes for you, get your hands on it, and then come back and tell us, answer that question. Let's be in conversation together on, on what makes you happy, uh, and where are you going to get it. Um, and so again, we appreciate you. You can check out, um, more at our website, beardedtheologians.com. Uh, we have guest, uh, blogs all the time. Uh, Matt, if you ever want to write for us there, you got a space. Good, <laughs> uh, awesome. and, and anytime you want to come back on the show, you got a space. Let me tell you, cool. uh, this has been fun. So, uh, but yeah, check out the website, beardedtheologians.com. We got some really cool content coming up, whether it's uh, blogs. Uh, we've got a lot of special guests coming up in the very near future. Um, don't forget to check out the 40 Days of Beardedness um, Litton uh, Devotion. Um, I don't know what day we're going to be on when this airs, but it's still going. So uh, don't forget to check out your free copy there. It's on the website. You can download the free PDF. Um, you can also buy really cool mugs and t-shirts and hats and all kinds of stuff that have our beards on it. Uh, they hold coffee really well, make really cool gifts along with Matt's book. Um, so, uh, but all, all the money that you spend at our store goes back into the podcast and helps us continue to do this uh, a little bit longer and a little bit better. So we appreciate all of you that have, have tuned in, that are listening. Uh, support Matt. Uh, go find his book on Amazon, uh, at the Cokesbury store, really anywhere online. Just uh, uh, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I bet you it comes up. We'll put a link here on the podcast as well. Um, but Matt, again, thanks, man. We, we appreciate you. It's been fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, for the Bearded Theologians, I'm Zach Bechtold. And I'm Matt Franks. Thanks for checking us out. 
Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening, and we hope that you share our content online uh, through Facebook and social media, and we hope that you check out our uh, Beardcast store at beardedtheologians.com and pick up some great Bearded Theologians gear. We hope you have a good day. All right, here we go. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast hosted by Matt Franks. And Zach Bechtold. Okay, you got the interview. You're uh, doing the introduction. All right, to me. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's, I usually let's, do that part. All right. all right. Okay, here we go. We usually don't mess this up. So, all right, here we go. We'll start over. We always mess you this told up. Told me it was one take. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could do it after this. We got to have something for the blooper reel. <laughs> all right, here we go. We'll, we'll we'll start over just because yeah, miscommunication. Uh, here we go.